we're going to prove this proposition. And usually I do a proof and then if it's a long proof, I give a bit of a comment on the proof and that comment usually takes the form, hmm, yes, I like this proof, this is a good proof. I don't like this proof. I'm going to say it right up front, I don't like this proof. But we have to do it. All right. This isn't an existence proof, by the way. It's stated as an existence thing, but actually I'm going to say what the measure is from the beginning. We're going to define the measure of A to be the limit as k goes to infinity of the integral over a of fk dp. The whole problem is, does the limit exist? Firstly, does the limit exist? And secondly, does the limit actually define a vector measure? I mean, it does exist and it does define a vector measure, but we need to show that, All right? But first, I'm just going to note as well, before you prove anything about this limit existing, if you have an N and if you have A in A, not in A and it's A, just, yep. And if you have a set A, then for all K greater than N, you have that the integral of FK, uh, oh no, A is an AN, never mind. My notes are too hard to read. If you have a set in the sigma algebra AN, and you have one of the elements of the martingale, fk, for k greater than or equal to n, then by properties of conditional expectations, this is the same as the integral of fn. And it becomes independent of k greater than n. So if a is in the union of these sigma algebras, this limit is stationary meaning it's eventually constant. And so the limit exists, right? So the limit exists on this union, but not on the sigma, well, not necessarily, or well, we don't know yet that it exists for general elements of the sigma algebra that this generates, or even the larger sigma algebra A, right? So that at least motivates the, the definition of this measure here. Like, if you take a set which is in one of these sigma algebras, this limit makes perfect sense and everything is well and good. You just need to extend that to general sets. Right. So now let's take a general set. And let's take a K. And let's take a look at this term of the sequence. This is the, we wanna take the limit as k goes to infinity and show that that limit exists. We can rewrite this as the expectation of the characteristic function of a times the function fk using this you know, expectation notation. And now we can use properties of conditional expectations. Uh, the expectation of a function is the same as the expectation of any conditional expectation of that function. So we can write this. Then this is true. This comes from the, the definition of conditional expectations, basically. The expectation is the integral over A, and A is in the sigma algebra AK, and we use the definition of conditional expectations to prove this. And now we use this property on the inside here, using that fk is ak measurable. And we're taking the conditional expectation with respect to ak. We can remove that function from the conditional expectation. It has no effect. So we can take the expectation of the conditional expectation of the characteristic function of a times the function fk. This is all just rewriting the thing we have here. And we're going to use this expression here. Okay. To show that the limit as k goes to infinity exists. Uh, by completeness, we need to show 
that the sequence of the stuff I just wrote before over k and n, I need to show the sequence is Cauchy because that's enough to guarantee completeness. So let's consider for all k and l with k less than l. Let's consider the difference between two terms. We want to show that that difference is small to get the Cauchy property. Let's look. And where do we want to show this is Cauchy? We want to show that this, hang on, let me, what is it? Yep, in x. Okay. Let's look at the difference between two of these terms and let's take the first expectation out by linearity and write it like this. This is the, the general form of the difference of two elements of the sequence with the, the expectation taken out the front by linearity. And now we do a bit of magic. We mess with conditional, conditional expectations until this is in a nicer form. So first we, what do we do here? Going bum, okay, we start here. Then using what I said before, an expectation of a function is the same as an expectation of a conditional expectation of the function. We just put in another conditional expectation with respect to AK. And then we write everything we had before. Okay, we can do that for free. Then what we'll do is we will, how do I want to write this in my notes? Let's put that conditional expectation on the inside here. <laughs> this is a somewhat convoluted way of doing this. Too many brackets. Put that conditional expectation inside. Let's just look at these two terms separately. We have an AK measurable function here that we can pull out of the conditional expectation. So we can write this as EAK characteristic function of A. And what we have here is just FK again. This, well, this whole function is actually AK measurable, but let's write EAK FK. Let's not write it like that. Let's write FL. L is greater than K, and this is true, right? Because F's a Martin girl. And on this other side here, let's just keep, do I want to keep that as is? Yeah, I'll keep that as is. And we write this as the expectation. Uh, well, hang on, what have I done here? I'm confusing myself. Sorry, for, sorry about that. Let's write. Let's keep the conditional expectation here and put FL there like that. I find this proof very hard to explain somehow. It's just, there's so much magic and so many identifications that it's hard to do it step-by-step. Step. You kind of have to just look at the end result and say, yeah, that checks out, right? We have that, we have this one here. And now we have an FL on both of these terms. So we have this FL here in this FL before we had an FK and an FL and that's that was an issue we've made it now in terms of two FLs. So what do we do now? We say, okay, we have a conditional expectation, two of these, we can pull that out and it doesn't matter anymore. We can get rid of it, we can remove it. Oops. 
like so. I don't think that was a particularly good explanation of that derivation, but if you look at the first line and you look at the second line here and you stare at it and you use what you know about conditional expectations, you can see that this is true. My explanation was not a good one. So let's now write this as the expectation of the difference between these two conditional expectations. times FL. And this function here, this scalar valued function, we're going to call this phi KL. So that this is just the expectation of phi KL times FL. Now, what did we want to do with this? This was a difference between two terms of this sequence up here. So we want to compare, we want to measure this difference in, in X. So the, this difference. In X is equal to the norm of the expectation of phi KL FL in X. And by putting the norm on the inside of the expectation, the expectation is just an integral. This is less than or equal to the L1 norm of the function phi KL FL. That's our first annoying technical reduction. Let's do another annoying technical reduction. But now, for all t greater than zero, let's introduce an auxiliary variable, t. And let's estimate this norm, which we want to make small. Small as k and l both approach infinity independently with l greater than k. What we do, is we write the integral over omega as a sum of two integrals. We take the sum over the set where FL is large, greater than T, this parameter T that we've just fixed. And we take the integral on the set where FL is small. So where FL is less than or equal to T. So it's the integral of, now I've got a less than or equal to here, let's put an absolute value on the inside, phi KL of omega and a norm of FL of omega in X D omega. And we're going to use different properties according to whether FL is large or FL is small for a given T. So let's write this as being less than or equal to, ah, before I write that, I'll just note, phi is a difference, what is phi? If I was to find up here, phi KL, it's a difference of conditional expectations of characteristic functions. Now the characteristic functions have absolute value bounded by one. Conditional expectations bound, it's non-expansive on L infinity. So this is less than or equal to two for every omega. Difference of things that are less than or equal to one in absolute value, right? So let's say this is less than or equal to two times the integral where FL is large, integral of FL. So in this first integral, we just take out this trivial bound for phi KL and we leave in F, which we don't have any control over on this set. All we know is it is large. <laughs> That's not very useful yet. And for the second term, we take out a T because FL is less than or equal to T on this set. And we keep the integral, or we said this is bounded by the expectation of the absolute value of phi KL, like that. And we just write it like that. What we're going to exploit is that phi KL is itself a Cauchy sequence. So when the limit as K and L go to infinity, this second term is going to vanish for a fixed T. And we're going to use the fact 
what are we going to use for the, the first term? We're going to use the fact that FL is uniformly integrable to control the sets where FL is large uniformly in L. Because we have uniform integrability as an assumption here. So if we had a stronger assumption, like you want to bound this product, the norm of this product, you'd normally need something like Holder's inequality, right? Or something else. Yeah. But here, we, we, you know, we don't have, but it's not that strong. Like we, we want to use, you need something like uniform integrability if you want to exactly. control. L1 norms. boundedness alone isn't enough to control this first term. Right. Like this involved, we know that FL can't be large too often because FL is in L1, but we, don't, we need something that's uniform in L. And this turns out to exactly be uniform integrability in an equivalent form. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It's all right. So let's write out the lim soup. Let's k and l go to infinity, k less than l. You want this to go to zero for the sequence to be Cauchy, right? This is what we need to control. It's less than or equal to the limb soup over the same parameters of what we just wrote above, which I'll write again. I don't believe in using copy and paste because it somehow takes too long for me, ironically. Well, running out of screen, that's fine, KL. Now, okay, we treat these two terms separately. This one here. We know that the lim soup is k and l go to infinity of the expectation of phi kl is equal to zero. Why do we know this? We know this since phi kl is the difference of conditional expectation. I'm going to write it to the left a bit. I don't have enough space here. Phi KL is the expectation of a, on AK of this characteristic function minus the expectation on AL of the same characteristic function. And we know that this is the Dube martingale associated with the characteristic function of A. We know that this converges to that characteristic function in L1 by the scalar valued martingale theory that we've already established. Dube martingales converge in L1 to this function. So it follows that this sequence of differences has to go to zero. This slim soup is zero, yeah. And the T out the front doesn't do anything because we've fixed T. So let me just write here. So for all t greater than zero, we're not going to vary t yet. So this second term here vanishes. So we can write the limb soup as being the limb soup as k and l go to infinity, k less than l. Let's put a two out the front. And let's put the integral on the inside here. All right, cool. And we have this for every t greater than zero and t appears here. Therefore, this limb soup on the left-hand side, okay, less than L, blah, blah, blah. Is less than or equal to two times the limit as t goes to zero. No, t goes to infinity. Why well, have written t goes to zero there? Two times limit as t goes to infinity of the, ah, one other thing I need to note here. There's no k dependence here. <laughs> K's vanished, right? So it's just a limb soup as l goes to infinity. And this is an increasing sequence. As, t, as L approaches infinity. So this is just a limit as L approaches infinity. Right. So limit as T goes to infinity. Well, no, not limit, let's just write a soup. Less than or equal to supremum L in N. Let's write it like that. 
So two limit as t goes to infinity, supremum over L in N of this integral here. And by an equivalent characterization of uniform integrability, which is in the exercises, equivalent characterization of uniform integrability. This limit of Suprema is zero. Good. <laughs> I've delegated the, the work there to an exercise. It's exercise 3.11 and it's not too hard. Kind of makes sense that you're looking at where the functions are large and you're looking at what happens in that limit as you go to infinity, but then you want this to hold uniformly over all the functions. That's uniform integrability in a different form. So that is zero. So what is the upshot of all of that? What were we working towards the whole time? This limit exists. And this is for all sets A in the sigma algebra. And this was our definition of mu of A. Good. I find that to be a confusing proof personally. The proof's not done, but this aspect of the proof I find to be confusing. Does anybody have any clarifications for me? <laughs> well, let me try. Just a very yeah. minor thing. If you go back to the beginning, there was this thing where you were particular unhappy. <laughs> uh, this bit. <laughs> yeah, this is higher up, higher up, higher up. Yeah, right there. So if you look, you have these two red checks here, right? This. Oh, yeah. Now, yeah, yeah, the first red that. check here, if you look at this expression, you see exactly, you see uh, the difference of two terms, kk and ll. Mm. In fact, at this very moment, I had the instinct, okay, you're going to add and subtract a mixed term with k and l, yeah. right? And then that mixed term is actually zero. <laughs> one of the mixed terms is simply zero, which is yeah. hidden behind all this calculation. And the other mixed term is exactly the, what the next check, which you are then going to yeah. elaborate zero. further. Go from here but I think, yeah. yeah, I think this, okay, at least, I mean, it's, it's not making that does difference. make sense. You're right. Maybe clear it's it's divide and conquer, right? You would split yeah. right away into two pieces and say, okay, this one is zero just because of all the martingale properties, and the other one yeah. is the one you have to work harder. Then the second one, it, it I felt, yeah, no, I think that that was pretty clear. You just have to work here a little bit. I yeah. The thing is, like when you read the proof like line by line, it's all very clear. It's like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And so on. But it's a hard proof to come up with, I think. Yeah, you're not alone. Like it's annoying for probabilists as well. So don't worry. Okay. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but you have, you have to bring in some subtle properties. You have to use yeah. that you are uniformly integrable. Yeah, you know? getting yourself to this point here is, um, yeah. I guess if you're like, if you're developing this theory and you've thought about all these things well enough, this would be a natural enough thing to do. And then you put oh, it in a textbook and then people yeah. read it. No, at some point you have to understand this point that the uniform mm. integrability is important. And, and then yeah. you just have to bring it in somehow, right? Yeah. And, and it's really not a property that I've used in my own work. Like I've only had to deal with it when writing these notes and, and oh. you know, setting up the theory from, from scratch like this. Because, okay, as a research note, I never, re I never actually use the right Nicodemian property as is. I use UMD and I use that UMD implies the right Nicodemian property through reflexivity. And I only use that so that I can talk about the duals of Bachmann spaces being what they should be. <laughs> That's the, the application for me, right? Yeah. But of course you can work on the right Nicodemian property in itself. And, you know, I should get back to the proof because we're not done, <laughs> got distracted. This limit exists so we can define mu of A like this. But we need to show that it's actually a vector measure and that it has the properties we want. So we're not done. We need to show that mu is a vector measure and that it has the bounded variation and absolute continuity properties that we want. But to show that it's a vector measure, well, we've defined mu of A for every A as an element of X. 
So all we need to show is actually the countable additivity. Finite additivity, if you just take finite unions and finite sums, that comes clearly enough. That comes from the definition and linearity of the integrals and so on. Finite additivity is obvious here. The countable additivity, if you try to prove it directly, it's not so clear, it's better to prove it indirectly. You can prove that a vector measure is a finitely additive vector measure is countably additive by dominating it by a scalar measure in some sense, a scalar measure which is countably additive. This is actually an exercise in the notes and I'll reference it at the appropriate point. Here's how we actually show this. Let's consider the sub-martingale. Remember we had sub-martingales, they're like martingales, but you expect to win at every step instead of expecting a balance. The sub-martingale given by the norm of Fn over all n. This is a, a non-negative sub-martingale. It's real valued. It's L1 bounded because the original martingale was L1 bounded. It's uniformly integrable. Actually, all of these are just properties of the norm process anyway. So this comes free. It's L1 bounded, it's uniformly integrable. There's a theorem in the notes that I didn't talk about in the lecture. So if you've read the notes, you've seen this theorem. What does my notes even say? It's at 3.38, it looks like. My notes are a bit hard to read. Whatever, whatever the theorem number is, it implies that this martingale right f bull x has an l1 limit which is a scalar g in l1 so we have the corresponding result for martingales and to prove it for sub martingales is a fairly straightforward application of the result for martingales there's what's called the dupe decomposition that says a sub martingale is actually just a martingale plus a positive drift term and you use monotone convergence to handle the positive drift term and you use the result you already know for the martingale part. I didn't do that proof in the class just to save time. So this process has an L1 limit. So for all A, we know that the measure of A, its norm is less than, I don't know what I'm here. By definition, this norm is less than or equal to the limit as N goes to infinity of the integral of the norm of Fn. Just by taking the definition of mu as a limit and putting norms on the inside. And this limit is the integral of G, this scalar valued limit of the sub martingale coming from the norm. You can think of this as saying that mu is dominated by the L1 function G. And L1 functions give rise to countably additive measures. And when you have this sort of domination, you get the corresponding countable additivity of the vector measure. That's in an exercise, that's exercise 4.4. That will tell you that mu is countably additive and therefore a vector measure. It will also tell you that mu has bounded variation and that that variation is actually bounded by the variation of the measure G times the probability measure. That's what this domination above gives you, this property here. And we know that the variation norm, well, this variation is actually the L1 norm of G. Okay, well, I only proved before that that was less than or equal to, but there is equality here. And from the scalar martingale theory, we know that this L1 norm of G is the supremum over N of the L1 norms of the original martingale. And that was one of the things we wanted to show as well. The variation of a vector measure is controlled by the L1 norm of the martingale. And the final thing that it tells you is the 
absolute continuity property. That your vector measure is absolutely continuous with respect to the measure induced by G. But by construction, that's absolutely continuous with respect to the probability measure. And absolute continuity is transitive. So that tells you that your measure is absolutely continuous with respect to P. And that completes the proof. Yeah, I definitely couldn't have done that before the break. So let's just scroll up. Uh, I think people are still writing. I won't scroll up yet. What did this tell us? What did we want to show? We wanted to show that there is a measure mu which has these properties here and which also has the property that mu of A is equal to the integral over A of Fn for all A in An. Right. And we just defined it such that that's true. The whole problem is just making sure that that's actually defined on all sets, not just sets in An. Yeah. Okay, let's use that to prove something about Barnard spaces. A nice theorem. Uh, if X has the rad on Nicodem property with respect to a probability space omega AP, then X has the one Martingale convergence property with respect to the same space. And in particular, if it has it with respect to all spaces, then you get the one Martingale convergence property globally. Now we basically have the proof at our hands. We just need to, you know, cross the I's, dot the T's. Um, I didn't mean to say that backwards, but I did. <laughs> Let's take F to be an L1 bounded, uniformly integrable, X valued martingale. with respect to some filtration. Of course, this is on the probability space that we're considering. I'm not gonna write that. Then by the previous proposition, there exists an X valued vector measure mu on A such that mu of A is the integral over A of Fn for all A and An and so on. I literally just said what these properties are, so I'm not gonna rewrite them. In particular, it has bounded variation and everything. It's absolutely continuous with respect to P. Since X has the radon nicotine property with respect to the space we're working on, there exists a function f, which is L1, such that the integral over A of f, this is just the measure of A. And by the properties of this measure that we have, this is equal to the integral of Fn. And this is for all A in An. And what does this tell us? This tells us that the conditional expectation with respect to an of f is fn for all n. And by the convergence theorem that we know for these Doob Martingales, we know that fn converges to, well, not necessarily to f, but to the conditional expectation on the limiting sigma algebra of F almost everywhere. And what does that tell us? That tells us that the Martingale F has almost everywhere limits, or has an almost everywhere limit. And that is what it means for X to have the one Martingale convergence property. 
at least with respect to the probability space that we're working on. Done. So really the hard work in this theorem is in, you know, taking this as like a definition of the vector measure you'd like to construct and making sure it actually extends to a vector measure on the whole sigma algebra. Then you can just invoke right on Nicodem and you pull out a function whose conditional expectations has to give you the Martin girl. As I said before, this is a, a classical proof of using Rudd on Nicodem property to imply something else. You construct a measure with the right properties, extract a function from that measure, and you go use that function to, to prove the property you want to prove. Questions? All good. So what can we say from this? What do we know about Martingale convergence properties and right on Nicodem and so on? We know a couple of examples and non-examples. Let's give a quick corollary. Uh, the space C0 of sequences on N that converge to zero at infinity and L1 of most you know, non-atomic probability spaces, for example, L1 of the unit interval. These don't have the right on Nicodem property. We don't really have much of a proof. We know that they don't have the infinity martingale convergence property. We proved that by explicitly constructing martingales. Okay, we didn't do it explicitly in L1 of this probability space, but we did it in an isomorphic L1 space where the probability space was a product of two point spaces. So these don't have the infinity martingale convergence property. Therefore, they don't have the one martingale convergence property because that's stronger, right? And Radon Nicodem implies that. So they don't have Radon Nicodem either. That's all. Nothing really to show there. So just to summarize, we currently have the implications Radon Nicodem implies one Martin Gale convergence property, which implies P Martin Gale convergence property for P greater than one, which implies the infinity Martin Gale convergence property. And we're going to add a few more properties to this list and create a loop. So before I go on to the next property, I'm going to address a comment that Marco made to me in the chat. It's about this unconditionality in the definition of vector measures. So let's just quickly note, if mu is a vector measure, then you have the countable additivity, which says that mu of a countable union of disjoint sets is equal to the sum of these measures. And Marco asked me something about the convergence of this sum. Question, is convergence of this sum in X equivalent somehow, maybe not necessarily directly equivalent, but somehow equivalent to convergence of the sum of the norms, right? Which is a valid question and a good one. And the answer is no, simply because convergence of this is independent of the ordering and convergence of this is not independent of the ordering. Um, that's not really a, a proof that these things are not equivalent because actually when you're looking on the real line, this is true, a, a sequence converges absolutely. I mean, a series converges absolutely if and only if the series converges in any ordering of the series. This is a classic thing in real analysis. I better write that down. Theorem from probably from your first year of bachelor, depending on where you did your bachelor. A series 
the real numbers. Uh, the series of their absolute values is finite if and only if the series AN converges unconditionally. I've stated that right, yeah? You don't need any more assumptions for that. This theorem fails in general for Barnack spaces. Not true if R is replaced by X. And unfortunately, I can't give you a counter example off the top of my head. It's a little bit more complicated. I'll have to look it up and get back to you on that. But you can have a sequence Xn in a Barnack space X such that now, which order is it? Which one doesn't imply the other one? Such that uh, I think it goes like this. And I, yeah, I'll get back to you on this properly because I don't know exactly which one fails while the other one is true. I think it is that it I can be that can, this, maybe, you know. Yeah. I think one can take something like one over n e n in L infinity, little l infinity. Yeah. And uh, then the, the norms are just one over n, which diverges. That's the one. That's, in any way. You know your counter examples, yeah. <laughs> Example, you take one over n basis element E n in little l infinity. Then what happens? Let's call this x n. Then the norm of x n in l infinity is the sum of one on n, which diverges. But the sequence of the series, um, sum on n, xn converges unconditionally to the to the element one, one half, one third, etc. Yep. So you can have unconditional convergence without the convergence of the norms. In a Barnack space, not in a not in a one dimension, not in a finite dimensional Barnack space, but in an infinite dimensional Barnack space, you can have this. And I think it is the case that for yeah, this is a theorem for every infinite dimensional Barnack space, you can find such a sequence. It's harder to construct them in general. L infinity is probably the easiest place to construct them, but in general, you it's a somewhat deep theorem to prove this. I forget whose theorem it is. I'm gonna I'll look it up and I'll tell you on Tuesday. Thanks to Marco for the question. Thanks to Leonard for the counter example. I'm going to have to remember that one. Does anyone have more questions about unconditionality? Unconditionality is actually a sort of deep topic. It's deeper than you'd think. This is already giving some hints that unconditionality is interesting. It's not simply convergence of the norms. Okay. You still have 10 minutes. Just, just to clarify something, just oh, yeah. so we're all on the same page. So um, you're saying that in a, in a, Banach, uh, in a Banach space, when you're taking a limit of a partial sum sequence, yeah. you take the series, which is the limit, which is some yeah. element in X, and then you're yeah. looking at convergence of the norms from the partial sum sequence to that yeah. limit in X, right? Yeah. And this is, this is sort of like weaker like the when you just look at the norms like you're summing the norms and seeing if they converge right because yeah i'm going to write this down just to be really precise just to make sure we are truly all on the same page to say that this series exists in x whoa what happened to my page there to say that this series exists in x means that the limit as n goes to infinity of these partial sums exists in x and this is equivalent to saying that the limit as n goes to infinity of, uh, I'm gonna write it this way, limit n m go to infinity n less than m, sum from n equals n to m. So we look at these tails of the partial sums. This limit has to be zero, which is the same as saying the limit of the norm of this sum has to be zero. But the norm is outside the sum. <laughs> yeah, That's important. Yeah. You can have cancellation effects using the infinite dimensionality of the Barnack space. That means that this sum 
is relatively small, but the sum of the norms is large, as you can see with this harmonic series example here. Sometimes awesome. your norms get big, but the vectors don't actually grow. Right. But you see that the norm of this vector, this harmonic series vector, this has norm one. Actually, when you add in the additional terms, it doesn't increase the norm at all. This is infinite dimensional geometry, right? It's a bit weird. And yeah, it, you might start to think, well, that's L infinity. L infinity does that. Every infinite, in, every infinite dimensional Banach space does that. Just it's not so clear. <laughs> It seems to me this very example works in all LP except P equal one, where it might be hard to make this work just like this. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So L1, it's, it makes you think maybe L1 is good somehow. <laughs> but it's not. You can still do it in L1. Banach spaces are weird. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are we all on the same page now? Or at least sufficiently close to the same page. We're in the same notebook. Good. Now I have eight minutes. I'll do what I can in that eight minutes. So just to go back to this, this chain of properties implying other properties. I think in the remaining minutes, I can add one more property to that. Just very quickly. Definition. Given a Banach space and a probability space uh, for delta greater than zero, an X valued L1 bounded, nothing about uniform integrability, X valued L1 bounded martingale F on this space with respect to some filtration is called uh, delta separated. if it has the following properties. The first term is constant. Well, the handwriting has gone. I'm in a bit of a rush. Let's not do that. So the first term has to be constant. Each Fn is simple. That is, has finitely many values. And finally, for all n and for all omega in the probability space, the difference between adjacent terms of the martingale is greater than or equal to delta. So it's a martingale such that at each step you have to jump away by at least delta. And you've also got the finiteness and constant starting point property. They're not so important. Uh, and the set of values s that the martingale takes this is called a delta separated tree why is it called a tree because if you draw the values of a of a delta separated martingale you start at the value of f0 then F1's got finitely many values. Let's assume F1's got two values. The Martingale property says that F0 has to be the midpoint of the two values of F1. So let's say this is F11, this is F12, the two values of F1. And the same holds for these. So let's say F11, you can have, so F2's got four values. So F2, 2, F2, 1, F1, 1, 2, 1, F2. Well, one, two, three, four, whatever. Two, one, one, let's say. You've got some numbering of these things. And you get this tree structure that comes out of the martingale where you fix a point omega and then you look at, like if you, okay, I'm confusing myself, but you can imagine what these things are corresponding to. You can think, for example, of dyadic martingales where they start to make a bit more sense. So F0, then that splits into F1, two possible values. And according to the which which value f1 had, you can have two possibilities of f2 for each value of f1, and you get this tree structure that branches out. And delta separatedness says that these distances have to all be greater than delta. Yeah. 
I realize I'm rushing a little bit because I'm running out of time. Maybe I'll talk about this again on Tuesday just to do it properly, but let me do it quickly for now and then a bit slower on Tuesday. Uh, so a delta separated tree is a set of values of a delta separated marker. And if you try to draw a delta separated tree on the page, it starts to grow because the page is you know, two dimensional. You sort of have to start spreading out. There's a proposition involving this, which is pretty simple to state and prove. If X has the infinity Martingale convergence property, then for all delta greater than zero, X does not contain a delta separated bounded, let's say a bounded delta separated tree. So if X has the infinity Martingale convergence property, necessarily every separated tree is unbounded. And you, you see that when you try to draw a, a separated tree on a page. Pages are two dimensional, two dimensional spaces have infinity Martingale convergence property, your delta separated tree is gonna blow up. Well, my proof's not in red, what's going wrong there? The proof is a, a one-liner, basically. S is a bounded, uh, bounded set. Uh, sorry, repeat. By, by, by bounded, you mean that S is a, is a bounded set? Yeah, S. exactly, yeah. So a delta separated tree is just a set coming from a martingale and you can ask whether that set is bounded. I think by definition, um, the martingale has to already be L1 bounded, in particular as L infinity bounded, because L infinity bounded, no, hang on. No, <laughs> you can have an L1 bounded martingale, it's not L infinity bounded, but yeah. This will be more clear in the proof, I think. Uh, the proof is that bounded, uh, delta separated trees correspond exactly to X valued. Well, let me start again. I've written this a little bit wrong. If X, do I want to do this by contrapositive? I'm going to do this by contrapositive. If X contains a bounded delta separated tree. Then this has to correspond to an L infinity bounded. So an L infinity bounded delta separated martingale. This is the correspondence between boundedness of the tree and boundedness of a martingale. So if you have a, Martin, uh, a delta separated tree, which is bounded, then the martingale that induces that actually has to be L infinity bounded because its set of values is bounded. That in particular implies that the martingales, the sequences of the, the elements of the martingale are all uniformly bounded in L infinity, right? So if X has a bounded delta separated tree, then it has an L infinity bounded delta separated martingale, which you call F bullet. And the delta separatedness says that Fn minus Fn plus one evaluated at omega is greater than delta. And as we saw in the counter examples we constructed, this implies that F dot uh, has no almost everywhere limit. In fact, it has no limits anywhere. The separatedness stops the sequence from being Cauchy. So this implies that X does not have infinity MCP. Just arguing by contrapositive. So what this tells us in our chain of properties, right on Nicodem implies one MCP, that implies infinity MCP, and that implies no bounded separated trees. Okay, that's another geometric probabilistic property we can add to our, our chain. It's a pretty simple definition. It's not too difficult of a proof, but it's a very useful property to, to work with for the properties we're gonna deal with next week, which is about dentability, whatever dentability is. 
And yeah, we've run out of time now. So that's the end of the lecture. Are there any questions? So this is all preparation for the converse, right? From infinity MCP to yep. yeah. What we're gonna show is no bounded separated trees implies every bounded set is dentable, which is a purely geometric property of the Barnack space, makes no reference to martingales or anything, just a property that bounded sets have to have. And we will then show that that implies right on nicotine. That's how the, the chain is going to work. So would you say which build. direction is the harder one from RMP to MCP or the way back? The hardest one is quite possibly this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, both of these are hard. I wouldn't say either of these are easy, mm -hmm. but out of the two, I, I would consider this one probably be the hardest from memory. And comparing that with the previous properties as well, I think these are even a little bit harder than what we've proven already. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. You can go directly from infinity MCP to right on nicotine. You can do it. I just chose not to. In ah. fact, it's probably easier to do that directly. <laughs> okay. How do you prove right on nicotine property from infinity MCP? You take a measure and from that measure, you build a martingale. And from that martingale, you take a limit and you show that that limits your right on nicotine derivative. The proof is in Pizier's book and I might have, I didn't include it as an exercise, but I think I pointed out where that proof is. I just don't think that proof is as interesting as this proof that we're going to do. Because we get more properties and in particular, we get this one, which is really purely geometric. Okay. Like this one property about dentability doesn't make reference to anything outside the Barnard space, whereas every other property we've dealt with has like martingales on some probability space or measures on some measurable space. This one is purely intrinsically in X. Well, one question I had, Alex, that yep. just sprung to mind. You, you mentioned in this uh, digital book, there's like 30 yep. pr equivalent property, yep. like, like equivalent <laughs> yep. characterization. Like, so, yep. so what's the flavor if you can give us a, an indication? <laughs> I, I can't tell you because I don't know. Them. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> I just saw them when I was preparing the notes. It was a topic of research for some time to, and I guess still is, to find equivalent characterizations of properties like a radon nicotine property. And now radon nicotine property is very well understood. You've got your 30 or whatever equivalent characterizations of that. You've probably got more. That's you enough. Yeah. It all, it's enough, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They all have something to do with, with L1 somehow. Like there's one equivalent property, which is representability of all operators from L1 valued in X or something like that. It's yeah. Yeah. I think they talk about representability a bit in the, the in the text in the, yeah. So, so yeah. is this more in Pizier's book, the uh, geometric, the dentability stuff? Yeah, this is from Pizier. And then okay. he even talks about a couple more properties that I don't go into. There's this Krein Milman property, which is that every convex set is the convex hull of its extreme points. Yeah, 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 Crime Milman. That yeah, one. Yeah. And that's equivalent to Rodon Nicotine property. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's it's a very geometrically like important property. It's it's one of the cornerstone properties of a Barnack space. And that's why I wanted to do at least a couple of equivalent characterizations instead of just going directly from Martin Girls to and from Rodon Nicodem and then moving on. Hmm. I thought it was important to learn a little bit about this. Yeah. But not too it's important. 